Welcome back to our CEO.ca community. It's day three here at PDAC in Toronto. My name is Amrit Gill, and today we are joined by Richard Pierce, President and CEO of South Star Battery Metals. How are you doing? Great to be here. Nice to see you and, and uh, exciting uh, PDAC and lots of people and lots of energy. So it's fantastic to feel the cold again and, and uh, see lots of excitement in the air. So let's get into it. Tell us a little bit about South Star um, Battery Metals. So we're a production story. We have two projects, one in Brazil, we're in construction. Uh, we'll basically be producing at the end of this year. We're going into production basically in phases. So phase one is 5,000 tons, phase two is 25,000 tons, and phase three will be 50,000 tons. Um, so it's, it's really uh, been 10 years in the coming. It's nice to actually see it come to reality mm -hmm. and not be talking about, you know, another study or more drilling or more of this or more of that. So it's, it's fantastic to be in construction. We're on time on budget so far. Mm -hmm. We'll be commissioning basically in October uh, and then producing at the end of, of December. So exciting to see it actually come to, come to life. Uh, in terms of our other project, we have uh, the Bama Star project in Alabama. We will be coming out any minute with a 43101 resource estimate. We'll be going back out and drilling an additional 2,000, 2,500 meters in basically in May, June, and then looking to get a PEA out uh, towards Q1 of 2024. So we'll be the first new graphite production uh, in the Americas since 1996 in, in Brazil. And I think we're gonna be the first new graphite production in continental US in 2027. So tell us a little bit about your experience and the experience that your management team brings to South Star Battery Metals. And I think that's a key differential for us. Our, our goals here are not to do some studies and trade some papers. We're about mine building and mine operating uh, and scaling. So we've done this a couple times in a couple different metals. Uh, we first got involved in this project in 2010. Uh, so it's taken us basically 13 years to actually bring it from concept all the way into production. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we've got a good management team in place. I'm based in Sao Paulo. Uh, we have controllers, um, supply chain, all the technical staff, our owners team are in place here. The great thing about the projects is they're the exact same geologic concept and, and context. So we're able to basically take all our expertise that we're putting in place here, stand it up uh, quickly and, and, and in good, good fashion and then take that expertise into Alabama so we can put that in production quickly. So we've got a full full team in place. Um, you know, we've got offices in Sao Paulo, uh, Alabama and Vancouver. Uh, so we're, we're uh, ready to go. Yeah. And could you share uh, details regarding the Santa Cruz project? So in, in general, it'll be 14, 15 year mine life, I think, uh, based on this next drilling campaign. Um, you know, it, it's like I said, we've been working on it since 2010. We're fully licensed, fully permitted, uh, basically stepping into production. We're profitable at phase one, and we're more profitable as we scale it into phase two and phase three. And we're signing uh, offtake agreements in the next 60 to 90 days, really. So we're, we're looking to basically transform from a development uh, company into a producing asset, and then take that expertise and, and knowledge and do the same thing basically in Alabama. It's an unbelievable time when I think supplies are really constrained for a variety of reasons from environmental permitting and licensing to uh, concerns about supply chain diversification and making sure that there's sources outside of China. China accounts for approximately 65% of all graphite concentrate production, about 100% of all refined graphite. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there's a lot of, of uh, impetus right now from Europe and, and the US on on trying to be able to diversify the supply chain, expand out uh, alternatives, and the governments are putting their money where their mouth is and helping fund future development. And uh, we're no different. So we're looking to really scale as quickly as possible and, mm -hmm. and bring high quality assets online so we're, we're profitable. Yeah, are you able to share with our viewers uh, the 2023 work program uh, details? Yeah, so for uh, for Santa Cruz, really, at priority number one is to bring phase one online in production on time and on budget, which should happen in December of, of this year. Uh, we'll be doing an additional drilling program of around 3,000 meters, maybe 4,000 meters, starting in July or August, looking to upsize our resource and reserve estimate uh, so we can 
justify basically the phase three expansion uh, and then scale that as quickly as possible. So we're fully funded for phase one. Uh, we're two thirds funded for phase two. Uh, I'm lining up the rest of the funding for phase two expansion. So we'll go as quickly as we possibly can uh, and scale that into a significant uh, producer. As far as uh, Bama Star is concerned, we'll basically be publishing our 43101 resource estimate next day or so. Then we'll be doing another drilling program, like I said, in May, uh, and then putting a PEA out uh, in Q1 of next year. So the goals of the company are really to have two mines, each producing 50,000 tons of concentrate and a centrally located value add plant producing material for EVs, lithium ion batteries, phones, electronics, uh, lead acid batteries, expandable graphites, et cetera. So that's you know a $650 million a year revenue, you know, maybe a 1.5 to $2 billion market cap company we think that's attainable in the next five or five to seven years. What was it that attracted you to the Bama Star project? Yeah, that was kind of a, 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 a freak accident. We, we were looking around at additional assets and trying to be in, you know, in jurisdictions that are strategically located that we can move projects forward in a linear fashion without too much difficulty from either technical or environmental or licensing standpoint. Uh, and we came across this project from some friends uh, and the geologic context for that uh, deposit were so similar to Brazil that it kind of caught my attention. So I took a second look at it and then had the geos and the metallurgists look at it and it's the exact same flow sheet. So we ran three tons through a pilot plant, confirmed the exact same flow sheet as what we have in, in Brazil. So the idea is we'll be modular construction. All of our comm plants will be basically built in 25,000 ton uh, per annum uh, modules. And if we want to expand, we'll just copy paste and put it right next to each other. So the plant in Brazil is going to be almost the exact same plant as what goes into Alabama. Uh, and we're able to basically take advantage of our commercial strength uh, and our technical knowledge to keep our supply chain simple, maintenance simple, uh, and the projects are really similar. So it, it kind of uh, caught my eye just in terms of the geology, the controls and mineralization. And then we looked harder at the Met, it was almost identical as well. So for us, it allows us to be first quartile of cost in terms of OPEX, will be extremely low capital intensity compared to most of the other projects out there. And because we're bringing Brazil online first, you know, we'll figure out what works, what doesn't work, make adjustments and then scale. So. By the time we actually get to building Bama Star, um, we should have that plant down pat, be able to build it really quickly. Yeah, well, tell us a little bit about the work that went into obtaining the resource estimate for Bama Star. Yeah, I mean, it's just drilling. Uh, it, this was a previous producing mine back in the 20s, and there had been basically mapping, sampling, trenching um, that gave us enough information to feel comfortable about what was there. There's a you know, 25, 30 meter high wall you can walk out there and, you know, the great thing about graphite is it's visual. So you can actually put your finger on it and go that that's, that's graphite. Um, so this first program, we were basically trying to understand breadth, depth, controls, make sure we understood the geologic program. So we put in 12 holes, about 506, 510 uh, meters. Every hole hit significant intervals. The grade was consistent with what we expected and, and and some of the other deposits there. So I think overall, um, it was a really strong drilling program. Like I said, we'll, we'll basically be publishing our maiden resource estimate here in the next day or two, uh, and looking forward to getting drills out there and, and uh, upsize the resource even more. Yeah. What is the uh, drilling and uh, preliminary economic uh, assessment looking like? Uh, again, so far so good. I think uh, very positive uh, results in general because we've, done so much work in Brazil. The economics should be very strong, similar to what we have. So, you know, if you think about Brazil, we have an $80 million NPV, five, uh, you know, almost a 40% IRR, mm -hmm. extremely low capital intensity. We'll get to 50,000 tons of, of production, basically on around 75, $80 million of investment over the next four or five years. Uh, we have unbelievable infrastructure. So when you look across the space, we're not paying you know, tons of money for a water treatment plant. I don't have to spend $100 million on 
roads or infrastructure or power, we're on grid power. All of this equates to really low capital intensity, uh, both in Santa Cruz as well as in, in, in Alabama, uh, and first quartile of, of OPEC. So we'll be competitive with Asian production throughout the inevitable ups or downs of you know commodity cycles. Uh, and we can put these projects into production for a relatively modest uh, CapEx compared to a lot of the other competitors out there. So I think the great thing is we're profitable just selling con. We're more profitable as we scale and as we move upstream, uh, sorry, downstream to um, you know the value add products, it just adds to the economics. So um, we can scale this thing from con, be profitable and work our way into the value add because it can take two or three years to get your material qualified for for GM, Tesla, Volkswagen, or, or whoever. So it's not like you turn the plan on and you start selling. So our idea is to get material in the marketplace, get commercial arrangements signed, cash flowing scale. Well, you kind of hinted to this, the ups and downs. Um, how do you see uh, the geopolitical landscape uh, influencing the exploration and production in North America for uh, battery metal? I mean, if you, th if you think about the, the current state of things compared to 10 years ago. 10 years ago, we were all about off offshoring. Uh, There's lots of nobody, you know, wanted industrial products or projects in their backyard. Uh, just in time production, you know, really tight. And I think, you know, for all the horrible things that the pandemic brought about, one of the main changes I think that was exciting was that people across the board, jurisdictions, countries, companies realized uh, how fragile the, the global supply chain is on one point of production. So I think as a result of that, companies and countries uh, have looked at really building up a more robust supply chain. And when you look out across the globe, you know, the Chinese have an unbelievable population and unbelievable technical expertise and, and production capability. And I think what's going to happen is you'll see three centers of gravity develop throughout the world. China has to feed a lot of people and have products for a lot of people. They all want, you know, houses, cars, et cetera. I think their focus is really on just making sure that they're providing all the building blocks for their society. And I think Europe and the U.S. are going to have to do something similar. I think what you'll see is, you know, global supply chain split into Asia, uh, Europe, and U.S. is three centers of gravity, and basically all the resource companies and production facilities will develop around those three centers of gravity. And I think across the board, uh, companies and, and jurisdictions are looking to be able to have a more robust supply chain so that there, if something happens in one spot, it doesn't make you run out of you know, rubber gloves or gaskets or you know, food. So I think really as we work through coming out of a pandemic and, and looking at the bright spots, um, I think that's one of them is that I, I think across the board, companies and jurisdictions are looking to have a more robust supply chain. Uh, and we look at South Star as just being one piece of, of a solution. And I think Brazil, when you look at it as a jurisdiction, it's number three in terms of importance for critical metals. Uh, we produce copper, we produce nickel, we produce uh, graphite, we produce lithium, rare earths, et cetera. Canada, unbelievable resource base. U.S., unbelievable resource base. So I think the building blocks are, are there. And it's really just a question of bringing back the desire to have industrial uh, and commercial production in some of these jurisdictions. And quite frankly, there's plenty of interest and in, in, in need for it right now. So I, I think it's actually going to happen. Uh, and it's just exciting times to be involved. We went through a decade plus of non-investment in the committed in the commodities and mineral resource sector. Um, 2021 investment and exploration was about the same as what it was back at around 2000. So I, I'm, I'm looking forward to companies going out, doing more exploration, putting more money into the ground, spinning projects up uh, and, and really having an exciting time ahead because I, I think with the constraints on supply, it's going to really supply a lot of initiative incentives to bring more resources online uh, and find new projects and, and uh, you know, bring production to a more balanced approach to 
you know, countries and, and jurisdictions in general. Yeah, where there are challenges, there are opportunities. Absolutely, that's, that's what I think I'm so excited about is, uh, you can look at it as a positive or a negative. I mean, we see nothing but positives out there. So I think uh, we've got a great team in place. Couldn't be happening at a, at a better time. Uh, we've got scalable assets in really strategic jurisdictions and there's uh, constrained supply with an exponential growth in demand. So it, it's a great time to be uh, putting things into production and scaling. In closing, is there anything else that you'd like to share with our CEO.ca community? Uh, just, I, I think 2023 is going to be a really exciting year for us as we kind of transition from development into production and then scale those operations. Um, it's a fantastic story with a fantastic team. And for investors, it's a fantastic opportunity. We're trading at, you know, 16, 17 million dollar market cap and I've got 17 million dollars sitting in the bank. Uh, and, and it's a perfect uh, Warren, Warren Buffett sort of opportunity for investors to get in early on a company that its goals are to get to significant production in the next five to seven years. And there's uh, a team to deliver on that. So not a lot of other companies out there can really uh, point to those types of advantages. And again, I think it's a fantastic story. Lots of uh, insider participation. We own about 14%. Uh, so we're well aligned with shareholders. Uh, and I think 2023 and the next 18 months are really going to be exciting times for us. Well, thank you so much for your time today. We hope you enjoy the rest of the convention. Thanks, Amrith. Nice to be here.